The Commission will come to order, and I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon, and especially to our very distinguished panel. Today we will discuss the state of human rights and democracy in Kazakhstan. The government of Kazakhstan, controlled by the authoritarian president for life, Nazarbayev, has long sought to obscure its serious human rights and democracy deficiencies by claiming that at least it is a haven of stability in Central Asia. Stability has, in fact, become the basis <clears throat> of the government of Kazakhstan's claim to legitimacy. Of course, stability can never be an excuse for dictatorship or widespread torture and similar abuses. We simply can never accept the hidden premise of the Kazakhstan government's talk of stability that human dignity can be bargained away in some exchange for stability. Likewise, we cannot accept at face value the claim that Kazakhstan is in fact as stable as its government claims. This claim must be carefully examined. That is what this hearing is about today. Too often in Washington and within the OSCE, the government of Kazakhstan's claim to stability is tacitly accepted. And that allows the government to set itself up as a model for other Asian and European countries. After last year's events in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Syria, we have to look carefully at authoritarian claims to stability. All the more since last month, when there were riots in Jana Osun, uh, in western Kazakhstan, which the authorities put down with deadly force, at least 16 people were killed, and some estimates go as high as 70. Many of us have seen the terrible videos circulating on YouTube that clearly show government forces firing on fleeing protesters and beating those who fell to the ground. I doubt many Kazakhs will soon forget these images. Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty reported the harrowing testimony of a 21-year-old girl who was detained while out looking for her father the night of the riots. She described witnessing the torture, the abuse, and humiliation of dozens of people who had been rounded up and taken to the basement of police headquarters, including girls who were stripped naked and dragged into an adjoining room. She herself was beaten. She reported what she saw to authorities who returned w with her a week later. The basement had been scrubbed clean, and the police claimed that nothing had happened. The woman's father returned home after two days. He said he had been badly beaten by police, and he died of his injuries on December 24th. There are many such stories. AP reports that journalists... Uh, Maine Police Department heard screams coming from what appeared to be interrogation rooms while men with blood, bloodied faces were lined up in the corridors with their faces against the wall. Sadly, reports of police abuse and torture in Kazakhstan are not new. In December of 2009, uh, in its report, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture concluded that, quote, evidence obtained through torture or ill treatment is commonly used as a basic basis for conviction. Since the violence in December, the government of Kazakhstan has said it is open to an international investigation and has said many other things that we would expect a responsible democratic government to say. It has also established a governmental investigative commission. I certainly hope the internal investigation will be transparent and serious and that there will be an international investigation soon, but best of all by the OSCE and that many good things the government has said since the violence are the harbinger of a new openness to reform. At the same time, we have reason to be skeptical. Just yesterday, the chief editor of an opposition paper was jailed as part of an investigation. So far, charges against police have only been for stealing cell phones and cash from protesters. And the focus of the investigation has been focused instead on the political opposition. Access to the town itself and to potential witnesses have been severely restricted. While some journalists were giving access on December 18th and 19th, they reported that they were under close supervision and not permitted to speak freely with detainees or residents. Prison Reform International, which the Kazakhstani government claims met with detainees and found no evidence of torture, told my staff that they only assisted in getting access for local human rights monitors to a very limited number of detainees, far below the official number of those who had been arrested. Contrary to the government's statement that no evidence of torture was found, in fact, the monitors cited four suspected cases. 
There are reports that those who have tried to come forward may have been threatened. Surprise, surprise. At least one of the local monitors who visited the detainees will no longer discuss it. The young woman I mentioned earlier will no longer speak about her ordeal. The persons who filmed the YouTube video, YouTube video from their window reportedly were sought by the authorities and have gone into hiding out of fear for their safety. Many people reportedly are still missing, but their families are afraid to come forward. Of course, we will also want to talk about the January 15th parliamentary elections, which the OSC concluded, quote, did not meet fundamental principles of democratic elections. The OSC details significant problems including the exclusion of opposition parties and candidates, electoral commissions controlled by the ruling party, media bias, re bias, restrictions on freedom of assembly, and problems during the counting process. I have spoken to participates in the, participants in the election observation mission who personally observed outright fraud, including falsification of the final protocol in favor of the ruling Aten party. Other American observers reportedly falsifi um, reported falsification of protocols uh, to the party's advantage, as well as ballot stuffing and people being paid to vote. I'd like to now introduce our very distinguished panel uh, to the commission. And again, I thank you for being here because your information uh, not only is received by members of this commission, but we disseminated very widely among the leadership of the House, Senate, Democrat, and Republican, and then there's an even wider distribution, obviously, uh, to the executive branch and to others in the diplomatic circles. So your testimonies will, uh, will make a difference. Beginning with um, Ambassador William Courtney, who is a career foreign service officer in the U.S. Department of State uh, from 1972 through 1999. In his past post, last post, I should say, he served as senior advisor to this commission. So we welcome him back and co-chair of the U.S. delegation to, review, to the review conference of the OSCE, which prepared for its 1999 summit in Istanbul. He was an advisor in the 1999 reorganization of foreign affairs agencies, special assistant to the president of Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia, and ambassador to Kazakhstan and Georgia. Earlier, he headed the U.S. delegation to the Implementation Commission of the U.S.-Soviet Threshold Trust Ban Treaty, and was Deputy U.S. Negotiator for Defense and uh, Space in Geneva. He's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations on the Boards of Directors of the American Academy of Diplomacy and World Affairs Council of D.C., Washington, D.C., graduated from West Virginia University with a B.A. and Brown University with a Ph.D. in economics. <clears throat> we will then hear from uh, Susan Cork, who's Director of the Eurasian Programs at Freedom House, uh, Ms. Cork is a skilled practitioner in supporting human rights and democratic reforms in Europe and Eurasia. Uh, before joining Freedom House, she spent seven years at the State Department, first two as Presidential Management Fellow, and most recently as the Deputy Director for European Affairs in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, where she worked to promote human rights and democratic reform in some of the most repressive countries in the region, such as Belarus and Russia. She oversaw the editing of, for the State Department's Human Rights Country Reports for Europe and had supervisory oversight of DRL's 25-plus civil uh, society, media, and human rights programs in, in Europe. She also did stints at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, U.S. Embassy Prague, in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs, and the Bureau of Public Affairs. Uh, prior to the State Department, Ms. Uh, Cook helped found and manage the U.S. Foreign Policy Institute at the Elliott School of International uh, affairs at George Washington University. She also worked with the, at the German Marshall Fund and as a media strategist at several advertising agencies in New York. Ms. Cook has a master's degree in international affairs from uh, George Washington University, its Elliott School of International Affairs, and a bachelor's uh, degree from the College of William and Mary. And finally, we'll hear uh, from Dr. Uh, Sean R. Roberts, uh, who is the director of the International Development Studies Program and associate professor uh, of practice at George Washington University's Elliott School for International Affairs. He has spent substantial time <clears throat> over the last 18 years living in Kazakhstan, both doing academic research and working for the United States Agency for International Development. While at USAID, Dr. Roberts managed projects in civil society development, political party assistance, 
independent media development and elections assistance. During this time, he also served as a short-term elections monitor for the OSCE emissions to the 1999 and 2004 parliamentary elections, as well as the 05 presidential elections in the country. He has a forthcoming article coming out in the summer issue of Slavic Review entitled, Doing the Democracy Dance in Kazakhstan, <clears throat> Democracy Development as Cultural Encounter. So we have three outstanding uh, witnesses, uh, and we look forward, uh, beginning with you, Mr. Ambassador, uh, to your testimonies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is an honor to appear before you today. <clears throat> Kazakhstan has a population of over 16 million. Ethnic Kazakhs comprise three-fifths, ethnic Slavs one-quarter, and Uzbeks, Uyghurs, Tatars, and others the remainder. Given this diversity, the term Kazakhstanis best refers to all the people of the country and Kazakhs to the ethnic group. In many ways, Kazakhstan is blessed. It is larger than Western Europe and endowed with a minerals bounty. People tend to pragmatism. Ethnic differences are muted, regrettably in part because political expression is limited. Rulers encourage inter-ethnic harmony, although some Kazakh advantages, such as political dominance, raise concerns. Selection to chair the OSCE last year was a mark of the country's international respect and weight. Kazakhstan has achieved notable economic gains, modernizing reforms, private property, talented people, and booming exports of energy and minerals make the country far wealthier than in Soviet times. In 2010, according to the World Bank, per capita GDP in current U.S. dollars stood at 9,136 in Kazakhstan, slightly lower than Russia's 10,440 but three times higher than Ukraine's $3,007. These data, however, do not tell the full story. Much wealth disappears into corruption. Construction of the extravagant new capital in Astana diminishes state funding for the rest of the economy. The economy is unbalanced. For example, the World Bank reports that labor productivity in agriculture is just 1% of that in America. Political development in Kazakhstan is stunted by 20 years of authoritarian rule. The tragedy last month to which you referred, Mr. Chairman, highlights the risks. On December 16, security forces in Zhenauzen in western Kazakhstan fired on unarmed demonstrators, including striking oil workers, killing and wounding scores. A chilling video on YouTube shows security forces firing on and beating fleeing people, as you pointed out. Rather than apologizing, offering amends, and opening a credible investigation, the authorities did the opposite. They blamed hooligans, shut off communications to the city, and imposed martial law. The hardline response may not have calmed tensions. Martial law was extended. A former interior minister became the new regional governor, a hint of unease about the loyalty of security forces. Today, on the date of this hearing, Kazakhstan's chief prosecutor announced that criminal charges are being brought against several regional police, executive, and state oil company officials. It will be important that due process be followed and that judicial proceedings be transparent. Otherwise, many Kazakhstanis will wonder whether these officials are culpable for the Zhenauzen calamity or whether they are lambs being sacrificed to exculpate the guilt of those higher up or better connected. The violence was an aberration in the country's generally peaceful life. The callous response, however, is symptomatic of a wide gap between rulers and ruled, between reality and expectations, and between those who live honestly and those who do not. In history, Kazakhs do not meekly submit to arbitrary power. In the 19th century, Russian colonization was slowed by uprisings and wars. In World War I, many Kazakhs resisted the Tsar's conscription and then the communist takeover. A decade later, Kazakhs opposed brutal Soviet collectivization of agriculture, such as by killing their own livestock rather than turning it over to the state. 
over a million Kazakhs perished. In World War II, Stalin exiled ethnic Germans, Crimean Tatars, and North Caucasian Muslims to Kazakhstan. A million Poles were banished there. Many of these peoples, starving or ill, were taken in by Kazakhs and survived. Vast numbers lost their lives to Soviet cruelty. Nikita Khrushchev hurled huge numbers of ethnic Slavs into northern Kazakhstan for the wasteful virgin lands campaign aimed at turning pasture into a grain belt. Other Slavs built and operated raw materials and military facilities. Alexander Solzhenitsyn labored in Kazakhstan in a prison camp. The Soviets used much of Kazakhstan for military purposes. They tested nuclear weapons at Semipalatinsk, operated the world's largest anthrax factory at Stepmogorsk, tested biological weapons in the open air on an island in the Aral Sea, tested anti-ballistic missiles and lasers at Syria Shigan, assembled torpedoes in al Ma'ata, deployed giant SS-18 intercontinental missiles in two locations, and conducted ballistic missile tests and space launches from Baikonur. Amid the military activity, most of the country was closed. Kazakhstanis had few contacts with the outside world. A vital lifeline was shortwave broadcasting by Radio Liberty, VOA, BBC, Deutsche Welle, and others. After the Soviet collapse, Kazakhstan returned nuclear weapons to Russia and became a model partner in the Nun Luger program to eliminate weapons of mass destruction and their infrastructure. Kazakhstan welcomes substantial U.S. and other investment in Caspian energy. It is a critical partner in the Northern Distribution Network, which provides logistical support to U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan. Close cooperation on core interests has yielded a productive U.S.-Kazakhstani strategic relationship, one of America's most valued. Yet, as Egypt shows, rulers must retain the consent of the governed in order to sustain foreign support. The lesson is salient for Kazakhstan. First, the legitimacy of personalized rule is in decline, and Janauzin is accelerating it. Transitions beyond President Nazarbayev, now 71, are uncertain. No evident successor has broad stature or appeal. Few, if any, independent groups combine the experience and acceptance required for effective political intermediation. None is so strong or enduring, for example, as the liberal Yablaka Party in Russia or the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. On January 15, Kazakhstan held elections for a new parliament, but no genuine opposition parties were allowed to participate. OSCE election monitors found that the elections, quote, did not meet fundamental principles of democratic elections, end quote. In another anti-democratic step, earlier this week, security forces raided the office of the opposition party, Alga, and the home of its leader. The courageous suffer. Journalist Ramazan Yeser Gepov, labor union lawyer Natalia Sokolova, and human rights activists Aidas Sadikov and Yevgeny Zhovtis languish in prison. Multiple factors, some unforeseen today, could shape Kazakhstan's political evolution. One might be the demonstration effect of the Arab awakening. Other factors may include elites empowered by economic liberalization, educated and connected young people, restive citizens in Western Kazakhstan, Islamic interests, disadvantaged groups, and Russia's policy toward neighbors. Kazakhstan's burden of autocracy could render its politics less resilient against extremist pressures. Second, the accumulation of wealth by President Mubarak and his family and popular resentment of it have a disturbing parallel in Kazakhstan. President Nazarbayev is rightly credited for improving the economy, but personal aggrandizement arouses concern and cynicism. Moreover, several in his family are multi-billionaires. Third, Janauzin may propel more unrest. One risk is Western Kazakhstan, which does not benefit commensurate with its contribution to the economy. Another risk is ethnicity. Janauzin was largely Kazakh on Kazakh violence. If large-scale lethal force 
were ever turned on unarmed ethnic Russians, consequences could be far-reaching. The Kremlin is vocal about protecting the interests of Russians abroad. Kazakhstan's regions with higher proportions of ethnic Russians lie along the border with Russia, a key reason why the capital was moved northward. In conclusion, political risks in Kazakhstan are rising even as the economy expands. The arrogant official response to Janauzin suggests dulled leadership awareness of human conditions. Repeated promises of democratic reforms go unfulfilled. Popular expectations may be climbing faster than the brittle political system can accommodate. Limits on independent political life weaken safety valves for peaceful change. America and Europe are widely respected in Kazakhstan. They should bite the bullet and do more to promote political and human freedoms. While some may resist, this will be a prudent investment in an important country and a friendly people with good long-term prospects. I will be pleased to answer any questions you may have and hear your further perspectives. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so very much for your testimony and your insights. Um, Ms. Quirk. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, it is an honor to appear before you and Helsinki Commission staff today to discuss whether Kazakhstan is as stable as its government claims at a pivotal moment in its history. I'm also pleased to appear in distinguished company with Ambassador Courtney and Dr. Sean Roberts. While working in the State Department's Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, I worked in Common Cause both with Helsinki Commission staff and Freedom House before, during, and after Kazakhstan's chairmanship of the OSCE to press together for human rights improvements. Just over one year ago, Kazakhstan's foreign minister said at the OSCE summit in Astana that that was a sign of the objective recognition by the international community of Kazakhstan's successes in its socioeconomic and democratic development. He continued to say that they endeavored to fully live up to their motto, trust, tradition, transparency, and tolerance, and be worthy of the confidence placed in them by the OSCE. Unfortunately, as we gather to today to consider Kazakhstan's stability and human rights record, it seems that the nation is not deserving of that confidence. While those who supported Kazakhstan's chairmanship argued that it could galvanize human rights reform, it has failed to do so. In our recently released annual Freedom in the World report, Kazakhstan continued to earn its not free ranking. This week, as we take stock of the situation, it's been a pretty bad week. Additional repressive measures have been launched in Kazakhstan, including raids of the opposition Alga Party offices and detentions of opposition activists and journalists. All of civil society feels under serious pressure and is nervous about what will happen next. Our Freedom House office in Almaty, led by Mr. Slava Abramov, is a small but dedicated staff continuously working on human rights and reporting on developments. Um, they are fearful now and said that the common belief amongst NGOs is that NGOs will be the next place raided. Um, I'll focus primarily today on the current human rights situation as gathered from their reporting. Um, which demonstrates that Kazakhstan is heading down a path of increasing instability. The recent riots and violence are not simply a random outburst. A leading Kazakh NGO, the Bureau, documented the growth of civic engagement this past year. Um, interestingly, the emergence of ordinary citizens as leading organizers of public assemblies, and 78% of these were on socioeconomic problems. As the government severely restricts freedom of assembly, however, the fact that more people are willing to challenge the government to have their voices heard is a sign of societal discontent. And if the government continues on its repressive path, more peaceful protests will turn to violent ones. Nazarbayev has ruled Kazakhstan with an iron fist since 91 and remains fixed on retaining power. When stability, however, is defined as keeping the lid on, it is only a matter of time before the pot starts to boil over. We've already talked about uh, Zhenaozen, um, and the international community watch taken aback as violence erupted there on the day of Kazakhstan's 20-year celebration of independence from the Soviet Union. For those who had been paying attention, the pot had been simmering there for a while, and as already discussed, there were some el underlying elements of social unrest. The oil strike had been going on since last April when a large group of oil workers in western Kazakhstan began to demand higher wages and better working conditions. While Kazakhstan has several billionaires, these strikes signaled that uneven distribution of the country's resources was sparking a backlash. 
Starting in May, many workers began camping in the city square in an indefinite protest, a challenge to a government that had tried and succeeded in squelching dissent. On December 16th, the situation took a deadly turn. We've already talked about the videos that showed police firing with lethal force at citizens' backs. Our reporting on the ground had 18 deaths, which is higher than some of the other reports. Um, and we were horrified, too, to hear of the abuse in police headquarters. Soon after, President Nazarbayev took decisive steps to try to regain stability. As already discussed, imposing emergency rule. Surprisingly, he dismissed his son-in-law, the head of the state oil holding company. He demanded a public inquiry and vowed to severely punish perpetrators. At the moment, the city remains closed to public defenders and journalists who may enter the city only if official permission is granted. The presidential administration, while it was swift in trying to usher in stability, shows no real signs of understanding the root causes. Nazarbayev's political advisor called the disorder a provocation against the president and then continued to say that criminals were responsible. Um, he said the president dealt with it. The situation is now back to normal, if only that were the case. Um, we've already gone into my... Ambassador Courtney went into detail on the elections, um, so I'll just note that Kazakhstan continued its 20-year tradition of failing to observe democratic norms. Um, and the election was a sham effort to meet its stated goals of increasing the number of parties in parliament. Um, interestingly, two days after the election, Nazarbayev issued a fast rebuttal, revealing what he really thinks about political modernization, saying that Kazakhstan would no longer invite international experts who criticize its elections. The government of Kazakhstan seems to only want the OSCE's input when it is good news. In looking to place blame for the growing instability, the obvious target was the opposition for the government. In December, the leaders of the unregistered Alga Party in Astana and the Mengistau region were both arrested. After the election, Vladimir Koslov, the leader of Alga in Almaty, predicted Kazakh authorities would continue to try the, to blame the opposition. This has been the case. On Monday, police and the Committee on National Security organized a search at the central office of the Alga Party and at the homes of Kozlov and others. Several were detained, including Kozlov, who was then accused of inciting social discord. The government said the raids were part of the investigation into Zhenaozhen. By tightening the screws, rather than apply, allowing for political competition or dissent, Nazarbayev and his administration are on some level admitting their own weakness and vulnerability. Mm. A confident leader would not need to resort to such tactics. Um, throughout the past year, the, the country has been shaken by several attacks, mostly in western Kazakhstan that were blamed on religious extremists, and the government responded by cracking down and passing new legislation new legislation broadly tightening religious freedoms and public expression. When I visited Kazakhstan last August, there was a palpable sense of fear about what this uptick in religious extremism would mean for Kazakhstan. Human rights activists I spoke with warned that speaking publicly about the rise in extremism would cross a government red line. The restrictive law on religion soon followed and was rushed through parliament in only three weeks in spite of protests from the OSCE and NGOs. It gives the government unprecedented authority to regulate the activities and structures of religious communities and forbids prayer or religious expression in government institutions. The specifics of the law are poorly defined and leave much room for interpretation to local authorities. Shortly on the heels of that, the new National Security Act was also signed by the president this month. It not only provides for the empowerment of special services, especially for combating terrorism, but allows for blocking of the internet and other communication. In addition, the law imposes a vague restriction that those who harm the image of Kazakhstan in the international arena can be considered destructive. This law could be directed against those who criticize the country, the country at international fora, such as this one. The government is trying to keep the lid on freedom of expression in other ways too. The new Broadcasting Act was signed by the president in January after a year of disregarding recommendations made by the OSCE and NGOs. It contains a number of troubling regulations that give the state additional control over TV and radio channels. For example, 50% of the broadcasts of foreign channels must contain domestic content by 2018. This new restrictive measure occurs in a media environment that is already under siege. 
Kazakhstan has preferred to view democracy and freedom as public relations slogans to boost prestige, spared no expense in promoting itself with advertisement campaigns and high-level consultancies such as Tony Blair. Admittedly, this has paid some policy dividends for Kazakhstan. However, in spite of trying to tout its harmony and peace of the country, an essential truth has been revealed with the latest violence. When citizens have legitimate grievances without an outlet, when freedoms are denied in the name of stability, instability and extremism are likely to increase. It is time to address the political stagnancy and lack of an apparent heir after Nazarbayev, officially deemed the leader for life. It is time for pro-democratic forces within Kazakhstan and the international community to start thinking about how to catalyze a more democratic, stable future for the country. Given its strategic importance, how Kazakhstan approaches the immediate future should be a cause for concern for policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic. I will conclude now with five specific recommendations uh, which were developed in consultation with civil society in Kazakhstan. One, it is important to publicly, at high levels, continue to hold the Kazakh authorities to their international obligations. Kazakhstan must earn posit positive attention, not buy it. Two, it is important to express support for civil society in Kazakhstan in cases of direct repression against NGOs and their activists. Three, the time is now to increase material support for civil society in Kazakhstan through funding and participation in various programs. They need our help more than ever. Four, it is important to put pressure on the Kazakh authorities, demanding that the domestic and international investigation of the events in Janauzen are allowed to occur openly and transparently. And finally, it is important to press the go government of Kazakhstan to put words into action and allow <coughs> political pluralism and not paint the opposition as the enemy. The opposition will hold a protest rally January 28th in Almaty and will try to contest the election results in courts. This is a test for the government. The West should pay attention. Thank you. Ms. Cook, thank you very much for your testimony and your very specific recommendations. Dr. Roberts, please proceed. Chairman Smith and members of the Commission, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here today to speak on this very important and timely topic, whether Kazakhstan is as stable as its government claims. As I recently wrote in a briefing paper commissioned by the Atlantic Council on 20 years of U.S.-Kazakhstani relations, the Republic of Kazakhstan is something of an oasis of stability in the desert of uncertainty that represents Central Asia. Indeed, this stability is also largely the result of intelligent policies adopted by the government of Kazakhstan over the last 20 years. In the 1990s, the government of Kazakhstan, with cooperation from the United States, divested itself of the nuclear weapons it inherited from the Soviet Union. Also in the 1990s, Kazakhstan's government was careful to adopt inclusionary policies for its Russian minority citizens and to establish close relations with the Russian Federation, which helped to substantially reduce ethnic tension in the heavily Russian populated north of the country. <clears throat> During the later 1990s and into the 2000s, Kazakhstan also adopted substantial liberal economic reforms that helped the country use its natural resource wealth to stimulate growth and create a vibrant middle class. All of these steps have played a role in making Kazakhstan the strongest and most stable country in Central Asia, both politically and economically. And the government of Kazakhstan frequently and justifiably takes credit for them. Unfortunately, stability is not something a state can merely establish once in its history. It is an ongoing duty of governments around the world to meet the challenges that they face in keeping their citizens secure. This duty requires adapting to changing circumstances and understanding the changing needs of citizens. Given the several outbreaks of violence that have occurred in the country over the last year, one can justifiably ask whether the government of Kazakhstan today is adapting to the new realities the country faces, and whether the state is as stable as its government suggests. After all, the Kazakhstan of 2012 is quite different from that of 1992, or even from that of 2002. But during the past 20 years, the same president, who continues to be advised by many of the same men, has led its government. This is not a recipe for an adaptive government and long-term stability. In the interest of time, I want to focus on three critical and relatively recent changes 
in Kazakhstan's socioeconomic environment that, in my opinion, have contributed to the growing violence and tension we have seen in the country over the last year. I will also note that the country's present government has yet to sufficiently address these changes and may be ill-equipped to properly engage them, bringing into question whether the violence we have seen this year is the beginning of a much less stable Kazakhstan into the future. The first change is the rapid growth of the popularity of Islam in the country. In the last several years, the re-engagement of Islam by the people of Kazakhstan, which has been ongoing since the early 1990s, has suddenly become apparent in public spaces throughout the country. As somebody who has been visiting the country frequently over the last 20 years, for example, I was struck last summer by the number of Kazakh women dressed according to Islamic custom in the city of Almaty, which is the most cosmopolitan city in the country. This rapid growth of public religiosity is not suggestive of a terrorist threat or even of an immediate move towards political Islam, but it does point to a changing public culture that is poorly understood by both the government and the secular middle class of the cities. As such, it is also suggestive of a growing population for whom the Soviet past, from which Kazakhstan's current leadership emerged, holds little authority. We know very little about this growing Islamic religiosity in Kazakhstan, but it is likely quite diverse and represents a variety of different understandings of Islam. While we know even less about the alleged Muslim extremists who clashed with authorities in western Kazakhstan earlier this year, one must assume that these people were representative of at least one part of this population that is expressing its belief in Islam more publicly. Again, I will stress that I do not consider that these people or these events um, represent a serious terrorist threat to Kazakhstan. Rather, I believe they are emblematic of the inability of the present government in Kazakhstan to speak to the needs, perspectives, and values of an increasingly religious population. A second related development in the country is the growth of ethnic Kazakh nationalism. Like the growth of religiosity, this is a phenomenon that has been ongoing since the early 1990s, but it has taken on new characteristics in recent years. In particular, the large number of ethnic Kazakh Oralman who have come back to the country since the early 90s from exile in China, Mongolia, Iran, and elsewhere are now becoming much more integrated into society. They generally have a poor knowledge of Russian language, are religious, and believe that they should have an advantage over non-Kazakhs regarding economic opportunity. This situation is increasing ethnic tension in the country, as well as creating fear among Russian-speaking Kazakhs in urban areas who see these developments as also promoting the status of Kazakh language. While the country's leadership has tried to balance the promotion of Kazakh patriotism with policies of multiculturalism since independence, the growth of Kazakh language use and Kazakh nationalism are developments they are not well placed to engage given their political education in a Soviet system that shunned nationalist politics. Furthermore, while the ethnic tension created by these developments has not yet exploded into mass violence, it has already manifested itself in numerous violent clashes between Kazakhs and Uyghurs in the area of Kazakhstan between Almaty and the Chinese border. Finally, and perhaps most ominous for the present government, Kazakhstan is beginning to face a crisis of rising economic expectations that are unmet. While Kazakhstan is certainly the most economically viable country in Central Asia, the country's middle class and skilled laborers have come to expect their standard of living to improve on a regular basis after a decade of rapid economic growth. A combination of the global financial crisis, a leveling off of Kazakhstan's post-transition growth, and the burst of a substantial housing market bubble have stunned, stunted these improvements for many citizens in the country over the last several years. Given the awareness of the income gulf in the country, these unmet expectations for improved standards of living have resulted in increased dissatisfaction with the current economic situation in the country among the middle class and skilled laborers. This situation undoubtedly contributed to the labor strikes we saw in the west of the country, and the government's violent reaction to these strikes shows just how unprepared the present government of Kazakhstan is to deal with such dissatisfaction. It should be noted that these changes in Kazakhstan's socioeconomic environment are not extreme and are unlikely to immediately cause widespread unrest in the country, 
In fact, in a democratic society, such discord and socioeconomic dynamism is expected, and politicians and different political parties compete to provide the best solutions for them. In Kazakhstan, however, the stagnant political system has no mechanism to adapt to such dynamic changes. Furthermore, at a time when many authoritarian states have sought to implement at least gradual liberalization of their political systems in response to the Arab Spring, Kazakhstan has shown no such desire, instead holding control elections this past year that differed little from those held in the country over the last 20 years. In my opinion, the growing dynamism of Kazakhstan society coupled with its stagnant political system could create a dangerous scenario when the country finally decides or is forced to decide on a strategy for presidential succession. With a diversification of powerful interest in the country, significant natural resource wealth at stake, and no experience with competitive politics, such a succession could become a flashpoint for substantial conflict and sustained instability. In conclusion, I will note that I believe that Kazakhstan has the capacity to adapt to these changes given the country's rich human resources and relatively broad economic prosperity. To do so, however, the country must begin taking measures towards the liberalization of its political system now. The gradual development of a competitive and transparent multi-party political system now can prepare the country to deal with presidential succession. But if Kazakhstan waits until a succession crisis ensues to implement such reforms, I fear it may be too late. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your testimony. You know, within the last couple of weeks, as you know, President Nazarbayev, I have uh, put into effect a couple of new laws, uh, one putting further controls on broadcast media, but the other that would make it a, a crime to damage the image of, of Kazakhstan. It occurs to me that as the three of you have been simply telling the truth and giving your best insights, all through three of you, and I'd have to put myself in that category as well, broke the law. Uh, I wonder if you might speak to that law. Um, it's obviously too soon to tell, I think, if anybody has been rounded up uh, under its um, provisions, but what will it do? Uh, you know, how much time might one get uh, if you hurt the image of Kazakhstan? Ms. Cork? <clears throat> Um, yeah, as you as you mentioned, it provides for the empowerment of special services, especially for combating terrorism. Um, it also allows for the blocking of internet and fixed and mobile communications. Um, as you noted, it imposes a vague <coughs> restrictions that the, that those who harm the image of Kazakhstan in the international arena can be considered destructive. So you're right. This this sort of fora is the act exactly the sort of thing that may cause our passports to not get visas. Um, but it's interpreted as closing off further dissent, closing themselves off to the West, which is, you know, contravenes um, their chairmanship of the OSCE and all of their declarations of being committed to political liberaliz liberalization and modernization these things to be seem to be mutually exclusive with this law. It occurs to me that it is so parallel to what the Chinese government does with uh, uh, disharmonious activity on the part of dissidents. It's often used as one big, vague uh, way to round up people and put them into the Lao Gai for long periods of time. So it's, I think it's a very ominous escalation or, 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 or further sinking into, into the abyss of, of dictatorship. Let me ask you... Uh, if you would, you know, the Kazakhstanis government and the embassy right here in Washington has put forward what, what many of us think is a very slick campaign, a PR campaign, portraying the riots in Jana Ozen uh, as instigated by hooligans and the recent parliamentary elections as, as democratic, free, and fair. And, um, I mean, honestly, do they think governments and do they think people, especially a country like the U.S. that does have a free press, uh, are so foolish to buy into what is so transparently uh, a, 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 a propaganda, in the worst sense of that word, effort? Uh, or do they think they might get away with it? <laughs> Earlier uh, last year, President Nazarbayev had an op-ed in the Washington Post right. 
which, uh, which could have been written by the propaganda department of the Kazakhstani government. So yes, one would have to assume that Kazakhstani officials believe that in some cases, some official statements can be given currency beyond what a dispassionate analysis of facts and conditions would suggest. And Dr. Roberts, I'll, I'll just add that, um, <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon because so few people in the United States know much about Kazakhstan. Um, and I think uh, sometimes, it, you know, if, if you look at some of these things that um, come out as communications in the U.S. that are obviously public uh, relations attempts, um, if you know something about Kazakhstan, they seem quite silly. But I would believe that um, people who don't know anything about Kazakhstan may take them very seriously. Um, and of course, um, it's also well known that um, U.S. consulting firms assist them in these in these endeavors. Do you know who's assisting them right now? Um, actually, I don't know because I think their former company was. Uh, um, removed, if I remember correctly. So I'm not sure exactly right now, but maybe some of the other panelists do. You know, it, it is tragic, and I would say beyond tragic, that very often that is the case. Uh, I, I know that uh, Frank Wolf and I have been raising the alarm on another country, Sudan, which just got the okay from the Obama administration to allow a, a representative um, group to you know, present talking points that would appear to put a gloss over, you know, uh, uh, Bashir's terrible and despicable crimes against humanity ought to be at The Hague, as we all know, uh, being held to account for those crimes, and yet he now is being represented in a way that, that, that puts a good finish on, on his terrible crimes. Let me ask you, uh, if I could, about the, um, the new religion law, uh, which they, in uh, Kazakhstan defend as aimed at preventing Islamic radicalism. Uh, your sense of that law, how bad is it? Uh, how will it affect the various religious groups and individuals? And as you know, Kazakhstan um, uh, is not, you know, has been reviewed and has not been designated a country of particular concern uh, under the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. Um, does this new law and recent events uh, make a case that the department ought to do that? Uh, you know, the, um, they have the you, sir? Okay. Um, so, uh, your thoughts on that, whether or not they should get CPC a designation? Ms. Quirk? As far as whether it should receive CPC designation, I'd say it's it's too soon to tell. Okay. You know, authorities are making the argument that the new law on religion will help combat extremism. Critics um, warn that the restrictions under the new law could backfire and fuel extremism rather than combat it. Um, so at this point, and one of the urgent things that our office is working on, um, prior to the swift passage of it, they were trying to um, mitigate and advocate with the government against some of the worst provisions of the law, but it was passed so so quickly with such determination from Nazar Bayer, um and his parliament that there was no time for us um, to have our voices heard on that. But what we're focused on now is monitoring the implementation and um, raising awareness in the international community when there's any problematic um, implementation of it. Um, I will know that they were in such a rush that before the law was even enacted, authorities started to using it um, as grounds to harass and detain members of the New Life Church and Jehovah's Witnesses and raid these groups' property. So they were in such a rush they didn't even wait for the legislation to go through. Um, but you know, it, international and domestic civil society and religious organizations, including Kazakhstan's top Muslim <laughs> cleric, um, took issue with several provisions in the law and think that will drastically curtail Kazakh citizen rights to freedom of religious belief. So time will tell. I, I would hope that all of you and would be looking at that and, and whether or not, I know the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom is watching it very carefully as well. 
because it seems to me that we have been far too slow uh, to designate countries CPC uh, and far too quick to lift it uh, when there's even a, the slightest hint of, of a thaw when it comes to religious uh, persecutions. And I say that uh, yesterday in this hearing room, I chaired a hearing, it's about the eighth one I've had on human rights abuses in Vietnam. Obviously, it's a whole different country, and, but some of the dynamics on how we respond to human rights abuse apply. And the situation has so deteriorated in Vietnam uh, against Catholics, Christians, the Montagnards, Protestants, um, the, the uh, Buddhist Unified Church of uh, Buddhists, uh, that, that the fact that they're not CPC is outrageous. And yet, again, this slow response, um, you know, it was lifted in order to get the bilateral agreement and, and particularly most favored nation status effectuated for Vietnam. They made no change. They got worse and, again, no CPC. And I know we have concerns about Kazakhstan. We have interest relative to our troops. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if that the price is to tolerate significant human rights abuse, I would think that uh, that's too high of a price. And, and I would appreciate your thoughts on how well or poorly you think uh, the Obama administration, the State Department, the U.S. Congress is, is dealing with Kazakhstan. Are we speaking uh, forcefully and accurately about what is going on there with um, perhaps some penalties if they don't change? Mr. Master? One of the remarkable things about U.S. policy toward the former Soviet Union for the last 20 years has been how remarkably bipartisan it has been. There was a very smooth continuity from President George H.W. Bush to the Clinton administration in terms of the emphasis on supporting territorial integrity, sovereignty, uh, and independence of the new independent republics, uh, building democracy in the region, providing assistance through USAID and, and other mechanisms, National Endowment of Democracy, programs carried out by IRI, uh, International Republic Institute, National Democratic Institute, International Foundation for Electoral Systems. Those programs have had strong bipartisan support all the way. I would argue that by and large, the policy has continued to be generally bipartisan for most of those countries. And in Kazakhstan in particular, we have to consider the enormous interest that the United States has. Uh, one, I discussed at some length the uh, military activities in Kazakhstan. Uh, Kazakhstan has dismantled an enormous amount of uh, infrastructure for weapons of mass destruction. And that came because Kazakhstan <laughs> with us and saw that America was a strategic partner. The second consideration is Caspian energy. At the beginning, after the Soviet collapse, a lot of oil companies saw that Russia had the largest reserves, but it was Kazakhstan being more moderate, which negotiated the first arrangement for a super, the, the Tengiz uh, arrangement initially negotiated by, by Chevron. The third consideration now is that with the situation in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and with the <coughs> proposed withdrawal or drawdown of American troops, which has a fair amount of bipartisan support in the United States, if transportation through Pakistan is going to be limited, the retrograde, the, the withdrawal of U.S. forces and equipment via surface transportation is going to depend very heavily on cooperation with Kazakhstan, with Russia, other Central Asian countries. So we have quite a few interests at stake, and no single interest can, can be pursued to the exclusion of the others. Uh, but that said, I would say that the statements, for example, most recently by the State Department and our U.S. Ambassador to OSCE about the elections, those have been fairly honest and, and straightforward statements. And the work that this commission does to hold executive branch to a high standard in all administrations has been particularly important and helped. Um, I, I would just add, I think that um, Kazakhstan um, is the type of country that the U.S. should be engaging on these issues. Um, I don't think that necessarily um, sanctions and just pure criticism is going to 
really get much accomplished with the Kazakh government. Um, and Kazakhstan, I, one, one of the, I think, very positive things about Kazakhstan is that it does have um, a fairly broad base of elites. And I think um, there are people who are close to power in Kazakhstan who have very different ideas about what should be done um, than kind of the old guard that's been in power for 20 years. Um, so I mean, I, I would I would advocate for engagement. I think it's important at the same time that the U.S. One of the things the U.S. has done in the past, and and I think to a certain degree continues to do, is speak out of both sides of its mouth um, about issues of democracy and human rights in a country like Kazakhstan, where we have an interest in. Um, oil reserves and we have security issues that we're interested in. I think it's important to um, be very straightforward about how important issues of democracy and human rights are to the United States' interest in the country um, and not short sell them. But on the other hand, I think that we really need a policy of engaging Kazakhstan because I think that uh, that's going to uh, bear much more fruit than just beating them up. If I might add, so while I was at the State Department in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and while at Freedom House, um, I've been on the part, my role has been advocating the human rights and democracy part of the policy equation. So while in full recognition that it's a complex um, policy environment and our bilateral relationship, there's a range of interests, oil and gas, the northern distribution network, um, a rest of neighborhood, um, economic interests. Um, at the same time, and I was in the State Department in the lead up to deciding whether or not Kazakhstan would be chosen as the chairman in office and making sure that it lived up to its commitments in all three dimensions. And it was found to be sorely lacking in the human dimension area. Um, and leading up to that, pressing them to live up to those commitments, and even during its chairmanship, it didn't. So I would say that um, continuing to make sure that human rights and democracy, particularly <coughs> this juncture, um, remains high as far as the policy balance is really important. I've, I've seen internal um, <coughs> battles on kind of the relative weight of the various policy interests, and it's important to have consistency of support for human rights and democracy <coughs> concerns, because if we lose the limited space that still exists, it will be hard to regain in the future, so. I appreciate that. You know, you mentioned the chair in office and the, the uh, considerable debate, although there should have been more, about whether or not that was a wise decision. I strongly opposed that on the record, believing that we needed deeds first and followed by a modest but a very real reward as being chair in office. And I wonder sometimes that when we put the cart before the horse, um, you know, history has told us in country after country, and, and I believe it's accurate, it's, it, I would like to know if there's an example that shows it otherwise, uh, that usually the day they get it, or the day they get whatever the benefit is, be, is the pivotal day when they start turning the other way. And I'll give you two examples. When we delinked most favored nation status from China on May 26, 1994, China went into a slide on human rights abuse. It was already bad, became much worse. Even more telling, and again, subject of, um, uh, of, of yesterday's hearing, in part on Vietnam, right here in this room, uh, when the bilateral agreement was agreed to with Vietnam, uh, they, were, they were taken off CPC by John Hanford, the ambassador at large, with a hope. He called them deliverables, that, that they promised him and the department they would come through on, uh, forced renunciations, all those things that were happening. and. There was an abatement of repression up until bilateral agreement and MFN conference, and that was the end of it. It went into Block 8407, a pattern day after Vaclav Havel's Charter 77, a uh, beautiful manifesto on human rights and democracy. All these signers came forward and signed it, and that became the hit list for the secret police in Vietnam as soon as they got the bilateral agreement through and, and MFN from the United States. The chair in office, uh, you know, wasn't as big, certainly, but um, 
I think in retrospect, we've got to get a lessons learned, I would say, to all of us, uh, that get some concrete actions on the ground, not even vague promises before. And, and I met with the Kazakh Parliamentary Assembly members, um, some of whom you know, uh, go to these uh, parliamentary assemblies that we have frequently. Uh, and I can say, deeds, just do deeds. All we care about is your people. You know, th this isn't bashing Kazakhstan because it's some kind of sport. This is all about standing in solidarity with your oppressed people, who you could be next if you fall outside the parameters uh, that have been circumscribed or, or, or established by, uh, uh, by uh, the leadership and by the police. So, um, you know, I sometimes wonder if the OSCE was changing. Mr. Ambassador, you might want to talk to this. You know, same thing happened with Belarus. When we invited the Belarusians into the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, I kept saying, let's see deeds first before they're already in the OSCE. Um, uh, the president of the PA from the UK lamented a year later that how disruptive and how, what a mistake it was because there was no movement on the ground of anything that got worse. So you might want to speak to that. And sometimes I think they try to change then what the human dimension provisions are all about as well as uh, election observations. All of a sudden they're siding with those who want a less robust effort because chair in office certainly conveys considerable power. So, Sir Ambassador. Mr. Chairman, let me offer two perspectives on yes, that issue. And that indeed is a very complex issue and, and one, sir, that, that you and the Commission and uh, the U.S. Government are going to be facing with Ukraine's impending chairmanship of the OSCE. One is President Nazarbayev used the chairmanship of the OSCE internally and externally as a very important legitimizing tool for his reign. So what do you think Kazakhstanis now, and how do you think they interpret President Nazarbayev's recent statement that we will not invite election observers who criticize us? Do they get to hear that? That we will that we will not invite. Press, yeah. So, uh, Kazakhstanis, what what's happened is that President Nazarbayev raised expectations in Kazakhstan about Kazakhstan's role and the way it might evolve, and now that's actually made it more difficult for him to be hardline in a convincing way in his country, and, and I think that's putting more pressure more pressure on him. The second consideration. If I could, Mr. Ambassador, yes. is that true even in spite of the crackdown on the media and the most recent laws, the internet and all the other, the broadcast new law? Um, I know, you know, the, the um, there's, it's not soundproof. Remember, the Iron Curtain isn't soundproof, that famous um, Radio Free Europe expression. But if you control the media, you still control what a lot of people get to hear and say or, and think. Uh, yes, no, that's quite true. Okay. But still, publicly, in, uh, in Kazakhstan, President Nazarbayev raised a lot of expectations with the OSCE. And then now he's, each one of these new laws that you just cited make it more complex for him internally to justify doing that based on the expectations. And as Professor Roberts pointed out in his presentation, this clash of reality and expectations is, is going to be one of the major political dynamics that affects his legitimacy and the transition beyond President Nazarbayev. Second consideration, sir, is Central Asian security in the wake of uh, U.S. and NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan. The one area in which Russia has made clear that it might be open to cooperation with the United States and Central Asia is counter-narcotics. It has said this over and over. Yet s effective cooperation is going to be difficult if Russia keeps the United States out of Central Asia, as many in Russia do. There seems to be a schizophrenic approach in Russia to how it should deal with uh, America's role in Central Asia, although the clear predominant view is to, to certainly remove U.S. participation in the Manas Air Base and to have the U.S. take a lesser role. The Russian government, though, as we've seen in North, the North Caucasus, has not a good does not have a good strategy for how to deal with Islamic extremism. And threats security threats from Afghanistan as U.S. and NATO forces withdrawal could increase. Now, I'm not saying that they will, but they could increase, and it certainly would be prudent on the part of Russia, the United States, Kazakhstan, and other countries in Central Asia, especially with the intermediation of the OSCE, which has a legitimacy, and the OSCE has fuel presence 
in those countries to start thinking harder about security arrangements and security cooperative mechanisms um, with that impending change that's going to take place. So I think the, the shift in the center of gravity of the focus of OSCE towards Central Asia caused by Kazakhstan's chairmanship has not been a bad thing. Frankly, I believe too, much, too many OSCE resources have been lingering too long in countries that are hoping to get into the European Union and not enough out in where some of the danger zones are. So there was that benefit as well, but that benefit will be vitiated if political openness in Kazakhstan uh, does not improve, and, and if, especially if it gets worse. Just to be clear in terms of my position, it wasn't that Kazakhstan never be chair in office. Right. It was only when certain benchmarks were achieved. Right. Would any of our other, other witnesses like to? I think one, one other thing that I, I do perceive um, as kind of a chronic problem in uh, the United States' approach to Kazakhstan is, is there's a, a general belief that um, Kazakhstan doesn't need the United States. Um, there's a, a sense that they have these other partners. Um, they have Russia. Increasingly, China um, is a major trading partner and uh, a major ally. Um, but I think it's important to realize that Kazakhstan has always been very interested in having um, a very good relationship with the United States because uh, precisely uh, their other partners are countries they don't necessarily trust exclusively. Um, I think there's a lot of suspicion of China's interest in Kazakhstan among Kazakhstanis, uh, including within the government. And um, there always has been a certain reticence um, to be dependent on Russia. So I think it's important that the U.S. recognizes where it does have leverage, that there is an interest it is important to Kazakhstan that they have a strong relationship with the U.S., and we have to uh, at least express what that relationship means to us beyond just the oil and gas and security issues. One final question, and, and I'd like to yield to Janice uh, Helwig uh, for a question or two, our expert on the commission. Uh, the And back to... Uh, uh, Jana, uh, Jana, Jana Ozen. Thank you. Back to Jana Ozen. Very briefly, the government has suggested that they would allow an international investigation. Uh, do we take that at face value? Uh, and in your view, uh, how quickly must that be done so that evidence, information, victims, testimonies? Uh, can be can be appropriately received without retaliation uh, to those who might come forward. I, I mean, the fear has always been when you get somebody's the equivalent of a deposition, the next thing you know, they're in prison. Uh, can it be done? Uh, should the OSCE do it? Uh, UN, some some other, you know, uh, cobbled together investigative team. How do you think it should be done? And can it be done? That offer was suggested at the very beginning. Yes. We've had a month of experience now and seen no sign that that was a serious offer. There have been circumstances in a variety of countries in which incidents that are murky in nature uh, have raised questions, and the United States has offered the uh, support of the Federal Bureau of Investigation investigators to help look into circumstances. Um, I'm not in government, but I'm not aware that Kazakhstan immediately invited that kind of participation or the FBI or, or international uh, law enforcement or investigatory authorities have been involved in any of the arrangements. Now, as I mentioned in my statement, today the prosecutor general in Kazakhstan announced that uh, a number, a small number of um, regional police uh, executive authorities, a mayor and a former mayor and some officials of the oil company, the state oil company there, are going to be held criminally liable. Uh, but that came out of the blue with no transparency, uh, although sometimes that happens. But from the point at which you announce that people may be held criminally liable, that they're being charged, there should be transparency in the proceedings and the trials and other things to build confidence among Kazakhstanis that indeed these people are culpable. 
And so right now is the most important time, I think, to hold Kazakhstan to account for having a judicial process that, that is worthy of an independent judiciary. Thank you. I agree that it's vitally important that there be a full international and domestic investigation. The state of emergency is on until January 31st. So up until now, there's been, it's been virtually a, a closed environment for information, which is dangerous. And they have not shown, while saying that they intended to fully investigate and find the perpetrators, they haven't shown a real interest in doing so. Their only interest, I think, is in portraying that as criminal elements as opposed to really wanting the answers to that. Um, so yes, I think it's important that the UN be allowed in to do an expert investigation. Um, and I, I think if the OSCE could um, field a team to go in as well, um, which would also remind Kazakhstan of its commitments within the OSCE. So I would encourage the OSCE to consider. Are there UN uh, agencies, uh, any treaty bodies, uh, panel of experts, investigative teams? actively looking to go in, um, arbitrary detention, for example, to working um, group? They, they have announced that they, I think it was the Prosecutor General that announced that a UN expert working group would be allowed into the country, but to my knowledge, it has not okay. you know, been given a mandate yet to go in. Thank you. I, I would just add that um, if, if there was any uh, interest from the Kazakh side of the FBI going in, um, I think that would be a very bad idea. Um, because there is experience with that. I believe it's, I think it was in 2005, there was a suspicious killing of uh, a prominent opposition figure, Altenbeck Sarsambayev. And um, when that happened, the U.S. government did bring in some FBI assistance. And the problem was that they probably did good work, um, but none of the information ever got out to the public what their findings actually were. And uh, subsequently, there were trials that were, um, uh, did not have due process and, and so on. And so it just became that the uh, FBI investigation was somehow um, linked to uh, a, a bad process overall. And it was, uh, I think, a, a mistake. Thank you. Ms. Helwig. Thank you. Um, I would like to just add a couple of questions. Um, first, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the recent parliamentary elections. As we've talked about, the, the Kazakhstani government has worked hard to create an alternate narrative about the parliamentary elections and their conduct, and has even gotten Western experts, parliamentarians, other organizations like the CIS, to provide public positive assessments of the elections. You can find a list on the um, embassy's website if you go to that here. Um, at the same time, we've also talked about the authorities' moves against the ALGA party in the wake of Jean Ozen, and also that ALGA's never been allowed to register and wasn't allowed to participate in the elections. And what I wondered is, why do you all think that the government has felt it so necessary to control the electoral process so much um, by preventing the opposition parties and the candidates from running, controlling by, um, almost all of the levels of the electoral commissions, and manipulating the count, certainly in some polling stations, including one where I observed. Um, and why do you think they find ALGA in particular such a threat, or, or do they find it a really serious threat? If I may, um, you know, in Russian history and the Bolshevik period, um, the word spark has played an unusual role. Uh, and when you asked the question, I was thinking you were going to ask about Yablaka in Russia. Uh, but in fact, we're seeing a very similar circumstance there. My sense is that leaders in former Soviet countries that have authoritarian regimes, while in some cases popular, whether it's Vladimir Putin or uh, Nursultan Nazarbayev, popular in some circumstances, particularly in which there are no credible 
people of national stature who've had an opportunity to express their views politically, had access to free media, um, or sort of generally popular or acquiesced in, maybe a, a better word in some circumstances, that they're scared. They're scared even of a small party. If Grigory Yavlinsky or the Aga party, or someone, there could be a leader who could start off with maybe not much knowledge by the electorate, but after voicing opinions in, in an open political debate, could catalyze greater support. So I think it's, it's the fear of a potential spark even from a small source. I think, um, I mean, the short answer is why they control the process is because they can. Um, and it's worked so far, um, so why change it? Um, I think that that, you know, may really be the perspective of the powers that be. Um, in terms of, I mean, it, I've, I've found that Kazakh, one of the, the interesting things about Kazakhstan is the politics are m much more complex than they look than they look on the surface, um, and there's a history behind every uh, relationship. Um, I would think that one of the reasons that they're concerned about Alga is they feel that um, there's certain uh, former government officials who. Uh, are injecting money into it and support it. And that that's, these kind of personal vendettas, um, in my experience, are extremely important in Kazakh politics. Um, so I think that that's um, part of the reason. To add to that, the Russia comparison is an apt one. I remember some media reporting saying that the problem with Russia having the huge demonstrations after the election was that it allowed a little bit of openness and Kazakhstan was not going to make the same mistake and was making sure to clamp down. Um, I was in Russia after the elections and attended the, the protest of 100,000 people and you know, I, I couldn't believe I was seeing this in Russia that you know, we've seen even a protest of 200 people be cracked down on um, so harshly, and I think Kazakhstan is very much afraid of that same thing. Um, I'll just mention one other thing, that in addition um, to being scared that the, the Alga party could gain some popular support, they're also scared of if they had access to the media, what sort of information they might reveal, um, such as corruption, murders, um, kind of other, other abuses. So keeping them sidelined and portraying them as enemy number one of the government, um, and you know now trying to blame the Zhenaozen events on them is trying to find somebody to blame for what's going on in the country other than the government. Thank you, um, and just to follow up on that a bit more on media and, and internet issues, we've talked about the new broadcast media law um, and also the internet law which went into effect um, a few years ago. The government seems to know exactly how to use all these new media. They certainly were using Facebook and, and Twitter and, and internet updates after John Ozen. Um, they brought a team of bloggers into John Ozen right after the events and actually posted their blogs on the, I believe, Prime Minister's website, if I'm not mistaken. Um, at the same time, independent bloggers seem to have been gone after, after John Ozen. One even reported having a gun held to his head while his, while his uh, film was taken, his video was taken. Um, we've seen an editor of a, of a major newspaper arrested, Stan TV and other broadcasters gone after, after John Ozen. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you think the new broadcast law might restrict TV um, what the state of internet control is, and in particular, the role of social media in Kazakhstan, particularly among the younger generation. Um, I know when I visited there, it seems to be that even though there are controls on it, everybody's seen the vis video of Jean Ozan, even though it's certainly not been shown on national television. Um, so if you could just discuss a little bit about that. Um, 
to start out with the social media question, um, it, there was a big discussion in social media after Jeannot's then um, on the reason and the role of the government and the opposition in, the, in those events. Um, one thing to mention though, most, most of the citizens of Kazakh are using Russian social media, which is more apolitical. So um, there isn't the same full openness of, of views exchanged. Um, only about 350,000 people are on Facebook um, and less than 100,000 are using Twitter. So those tools have not been fully realized in the country. So um, young people are using social media. What our office is reporting though is that it's more for entertainment and searching for information purposes and that the Zhenaozen events um, were sort of a, them following that so closely was a relatively new development. Let me talk about our media. Um, we made a mistake in ending the Kazakh service on the Voice of America. That mistake needs to be changed. Kazakhstan is too important a country to have been excluded. Secondly, Russian is still the language throughout Central Asia. VOA should establish a Central Asian Russian service run by Central Asian broadcasters uh, to expand information. And again, if we're in a circumstance of withdrawal or drawdown in Afghanistan, which is going to lead to greater insecurity in Central Asia, it's time now to start making these kinds of prudent, uh, very cost-effective investments. The Kazakh service that Radio Liberty has had has been very important, uh, but even Radio Liberty broadcasts in Kazakh and Russian oriented toward Kazakhstan and Central Asia should be strengthened. I'll just, uh, I'll just add that um, I think that uh, the Kazakhstan government has always seen the control of the media as probably its most important mechanism for uh, preventing political dissent. And um, they've been very, uh, I would say, smart about how they've gone about it. They have not um, done the type of things you see in Uzbekistan where you completely cannot access an op opposition media. They just limit it so they, they understand that there's a certain number of people who are going to be with the opposition. Um, and if they can limit access to that information, um, allow those people to share it amongst themselves, um, then uh, they feel that they're fine, that it's safe. Uh, so it's always been to to limit the ability of the opposition. The opposition has no access to television. Um, you know, they've really only had the print media to date, and they've always tried to limit the ability to get those uh, newspapers out. Um, now that said, uh, the internet is an interesting um, dilemma for Kazakhstan, I think, because it's much less predictable. And um, I haven't really looked at this new law, but my guess is that that would be a major part of it, is trying to um, decide how they're going to be able to limit access to the internet. Just to add to that, the new law will essentially allow them to intensify a trend that we saw already in the past year, um, that the government, in, under the guise of extremism um, and co countering terrorism, um, expanded their attempts to identify websites that had supposedly, quote, destructive content, blocking the blogging sites LiveJournal and LiveInternet.ru and 20 other sites. Um, so I think they're adding they already have a lot of tools to crack down on media freedom and the internet, but they're just stacking their arsenal, I think, with the new law. Let me ask one final question on sex trafficking and trafficking in general. Uh, as you might know, Kazakhstan was designated a tier two country uh, in the last round, and, that, and obviously the data calls are out or going out, and we'll know soon whether or not progress continued. And, perhaps based on what you've heard, is that trend continuing? Uh, Kazakhstan is a destination and to a lesser extent source and transit country for women and girls subjected to sex trafficking and for men, women, and children subjecting to conditions of forced labor. Uh, our tip report for the most recent report 
uh, and that would be for the year 2010, uh, said that while Kazakhstan does not fully comply with the minimum standards for the elimination of trafficking, it is making, however, significant efforts to do so, and noted in pertinent point uh, that there was a significant decrease in the use of forced child labor in the cotton harvest, increased law enforcement efforts against human trafficking, and they passed a law uh, that hiked uh, penalties. And I, I'm wondering if any of you have any knowledge or information or insight as to whether or not that trend continued into 2011. That would have been for 2010 calendar year. Yes. That's something I can get back to you with more information. Okay, my yeah, my understanding of the situation has not been that there's been a huge change in the situation, um, but I can talk to our staff in Almaty and see if they could get us some more updated information, but um, I, I haven't witnessed um, a, huge, a huge change. Thank you. I want to thank our very distinguished witnesses for your, your testimony. If there's anything you'd like to say uh, before we close. Mr. Ambassador. Sir, you made reference to the Arab awakening earlier. In the former Soviet Union, many people believe that Western Europe is more politically mature as well as more prosperous. Many people believe that those are the kinds of conditions to which people should aspire in the former Soviet Union. Even as many disagree about what should be the trade-offs today uh, between democratic change and economic advancement in Russia or Kazakhstan or, or other countries. The Arab awakening has had an interesting impact in the former Soviet Union. Without overgeneralizing, many people in the former Soviet Union have tended to believe that political culture in the Arab world has been less advanced than in the former Soviet space. For people in the former Soviet Union to see young people have the courage to go out into the streets in Tunisia, Egypt, and now especially in Syria where young people are going out in the streets every day risking death, fighting for some measure of greater political equity or more competitive, more open political arrangements, and those, those goals may vary widely in Syria in part because of the ethnic makeup of the country. But for people in the former Soviet Union to see these young people going out and risking injury and death every day for some more responsive political system, that I think to some extent is, is embarrassing for many people in the former Soviet Union because we haven't seen people in the former Soviet Union go out and ri take those same risks day after day. Uh, so I think it's this is, if you will, concentrated the mind a bit in uh, the former Soviet Union among a number of people whom we, we today can't predict how that's having an impact and the impact may be very different in Ukraine or Russia or Kazakhstan or other places. But I, I think what's happening in the Arab waking is concentrating the mind and probably is going to have a helpful effect um, in the former Soviet Union. And causing people to think harder about the choices they should be making for greater political openness and, and greater political and human freedoms. Yes, Dr. Roberts, thank you. And Mr. Ambassador. Um, to, to add on that, I think um, one of the interesting, um, going back to a, a media issue, um, the people of Kazakhstan consume Russian media um, on a steady diet. and. So I think the, the changes that happened in Ukraine in 2005 and in Georgia, um, that didn't really have much influence on people in Kazakhstan. But if, um, if we do see that these protests in Russia continue and we see that there is um, even any kind, of, any kind of change coming out of the next presidential election in Russia, that would have massive impact, I think, in Kazakhstan. Um, because I think most people in Kazakhstan kind of see Russia as their reference point. Um, and that's partially just because that's what they watch on TV every day. Um, and, you know, they, I think if they, if they saw 
changes in Russia that would very quickly translate to changes in Kazakhstan. I'd just like to say thank you um, for holding this panel today. It's very important, and I'd like to end just on a final note. Civil society um, and our office as well has noted this, um, that they've noticed a waning interest from the international community in civil society following uh, Kazakhstan's chairmanship. Um, and right now they need the attention of the of Europe and the U.S. more than ever. Um, so I would urge the U.S. to give support vocally and materially to civil society and urge European counterparts to do the same. Thank you. Excellent point. And this commission will certainly try to do that as well. And I thank you for all of your very valuable insights. Your, this is of, of extraordinary benefit to the commission, and I hope to the rest of the Congress by extension. Um, without any further ado, the hearing is adjourned, and I thank you again. My daughter is a junior at William Oh, yeah? Yeah, she loves it. Yeah,